Hey guys, Irit Isips here for CSN Practice, the customer success strategy consulting firm. A lot of you in customer success might be responsible for onboarding, and if not, everybody in the company should be really worried and concerned when onboarding doesn't go exactly well. But even if the process is pretty good, what I find is that a lot of times the process is super manual. There's not a lot of clearance around, you know, milestones the customer is going through as they go through the onboarding journey. And many times, at least for larger companies, the onboarding and implementation process is still run in on-prem software or like in specific files, like project management files that not everybody in the company has exposure to. And it's not always a scalable process. So I thought, why don't we do a video about how to make sure you have the right customer onboarding tech stack selected? What are the criteria and what is the process that you should apply to? First of all, evaluate, do you have the right software in place? And then how do you select the right ones for your organization? actually invited Phil David, who's the senior VP of customer success at a company called Condeco. He actually went through this process very recently. And so he'll share his real life expertise and experience with you. And so hopefully you can adopt those and try those out in your organization. Hey, Phil, thanks so much for joining our channel today and taking the time to share. No, no problem at all, Lirit, and thank you very much for having me on to talk about my experience. You're currently in Condeco, and you used to own the project management office and recently got promoted as a senior VP of customer success. Congratulations. Thank you very much. As the person responsible for the PMO, project management office, can you tell me how you came to Condeco and what was the idea around creating stability to those processes? Condeco had been moving on a journey to go from being kind of a legacy on-prem system to full-on SaaS. And so unlike other SaaS companies that maybe were a startup and, and started with nothing, they were transitioning from deploying customer projects, getting customers using the platform in a far more old school type method. And the business had brought in a chief customer officer, uh, Kev Willers, who used to be from Salesforce, and was starting to really look at properly kind of introducing that onboarding journey as a SaaS business wants it to be. And you know, from my first conversations with them, it became very clear that visibility of what was going on was missing and that a tool was going to be needed to help kind of support that growth and the hyper growth that was going on across the business. They needed visibility of everything that was happening across all projects and all regions. And it just wasn't there at that time. Phil, I can't tell you how often this problem actually exists in so many companies. So I think this video is going to be so awesome because you actually sold this. And so what was your approach? What were the, some of the first things that you've done? Just start this process of optimizing things out. I think it's really important to think about the start of the process because you can very quickly get drawn into, hey, we're going to need a tool. We're going to need a nice platform to kind of do this on. But actually, before I got anywhere near that, the first thing I wanted to do was kind of sit down and fully evaluate not just the PMO, but the delivery operation and say, great, how do we do it today? How well are we doing it? And what I came out with from, from that full review is what I call a state of play document, and it measured the business on a maturity model, seven different stages, seven different items, which are specific to Condeco, because not all of them are going to be relevant to every business, kind of how mature we were on that kind of competency grade. And that let me look at very kind of granularly, these are the areas we need to focus on. These are the things that we're going to try and work on and improve over the next year. What are the competencies that you had in that document that you think might be relevant for other companies? I built it using some of the input from, say, the SPI, so Service Performance Insights, and some other models that I'd seen, and then looking across Condeco as a business and say, right, what do we do as a PMO? Some of the, the items that are in there is, for example, sales and ordering, so we can check the pipeline and forecast. How good are we at knowing what's 
going to happen and what's coming to us. Overall project health management. We've got a big portfolio of projects. How are they being managed? How are we checking that they're not being left unsupervised? Capacity planning for kind of what's happening yesterday, what happened yesterday, what's happening today, what's likely to happen tomorrow. And a big one for us was financial management. So revenue management, can we predict cost spending? Can we predict what's going to happen over the next few months? It's about kind of looking at those various different ones. Yeah, I was able to look at very specifically, these are things that we look to achieve now. And these are things that we can achieve in a few months time. What was this process helping you with specifically? What did it shed light on? Was this like an epiphany? Yeah, if we invested in an onboarding tool, a lot of these issues or we can increase the maturity model. What was the objective here? If you liked what you've heard so far, that's awesome. More coming in a second here. But in the meantime, I want you to click that like button so that YouTube knows that this is great content and you can start sharing it with others. The intention was to look at very specific goals that I could put in front of the senior leadership and the CEO and say, if we get a tool, it will help us do X, Y, and Z. But again, very important not to just say, here, we're going to do this with the tool. Actually, these are the things that we're going to do before we put a tool in place. We need to achieve all of these bits of growth in these different areas. These are the things we can do now. And then once we've got a tool, these are the things that we can do afterwards. And looking to put as much as possible kind of real metrics behind those gains, being able to say, if we do X, the impact of the business will be Y. So you did the assessment against the maturity. You got some insights around what are the areas that needs to focus. You shared some of the areas, the pillars that you are looking at, the criteria. And then you said, well, there's some things that we should be doing before we invest in an onboarding solution. I would say that that's just brilliant. We see a lot of companies where they don't really have the right strategy. And so the first thing that they do is like, all right, let's get a software and that will force us to have more mature processes, but you're saying, no, 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 time out. Let's do some due diligence first. So what were some of the things that you were actually recommending to do before the purchase of an onboarding software? Having delivered software to companies through a project team, as exactly as you say, if you, if you just bring in a tool, it's not going to fix your problems. You're going to have the same processes just with a shinier tool and some more bells and whistles. Get your groundwork started. A very simple thing, like we, we wanted to make sure that we were reporting utilization. Now, the tool is going to help us. The tool is going to automate. The tool is going to make sure that we're doing it. But until then, we can report on utilization. We can share that with the teams and we can start them thinking about, great, I need to be conscious of what I'm doing with my time. I need to be logging timesheets. I need to be collecting that information. So we got all of that sorted first. Then when we introduce the tool, suddenly we're saving a lot of time. Everything's much easier. We can do predictions from it, which we couldn't do whilst everything was being done manually. But the baseline is already set. The other thing that you said that happened after the assessment or how you (laughs) leveraged the assessment or the roadmap that you proposed is one, justifying the investments in an optimized strategy and the purchase of the solution and really distincting between the impact that the new processes are going to have versus the impact that the solution or the technology is going to have. I actually ended up with a roadmap, which was split into two different colors. These are all the things we can do without a new system. These are all the things that we would need a platform to really enable us to do because we couldn't do them at scale. I actually put a month's break between them on the roadmap and said, here's my delivery window. We're not going to be doing any of the other stuff, the process changes during the delivery window. After that, we're going to really focus on kind of delivering things off the back of the product. We focused beforehand on, you know, those small wins, those quick things in terms of we weren't looking at the PMO's workload on a regular basis. So great, let's start introducing regular reviews where we're going to look at the workload that's coming in. After the tool, right, now we want a dashboard that is live updated every day so we can just click refresh so we can see that information so it's moving from we want to be able to do it we're doing it to it's now automated and it's there available for us you also mentioned that you have identified the success indicators or metrics by which you're going to prove that the changes were actually impactful could you share what those kpis were before we continue Don't forget, subscribe to our YouTube channel and smash that notification button so that you don't miss out on any new videos. I put in to a business case that I shared with 
the vendors in the process. Mm. So I kind of said to them, this is how I'm going to measure success internally. You need to see it because this is how I'm going to measure success with you. Uh, it was on three different things. It was utilization improvements. That would mean that we could do more with the team that we already had. So we were going to get more usage out of the team. Projects delivered quicker. Revenue was going to come through sooner and a better control on costs. During analysis with the PMO, I found that 15% of their time was being spent just moving data from one platform to another. As a simple example, people would put their time cards into a finance platform and the PMO would have to go through and move those hours manually and say, okay, you've done 10, okay, and move it over onto the projects on a weekly basis. And that would take three or four days every week of the team's time. So the reduction in wastage by having connected platforms. And then the last one was about customer CSAT adoption and saying, look, if we're delivering better projects, we should be seeing an improvement in CSAT. So again, we started assessing CSAT before the product went in, start sending out surveys. And we're now still doing that. And we're kind of tracking those improvements as well. Improvement in utilization, reduction of wastage and improvement of customer satisfaction. Yes. So obviously there were a lot of things that you were looking forward to accomplish with a new onboarding tool. How did you approach the next steps? How did you select a vendor? In the end, I actually ended up with two vendors. So we went with one, which was for our surveys, but our project tool, I was able to draw up a shortlist pretty quick. As I said, we sent out that information that said, these are what we're trying to achieve. These are the outputs that we're trying to get to and the metrics we're going to measure on. But also here are some specific kind of feature requirements or capabilities. So, you know, here's our standard spreadsheet of everything we need you to do. And then I kind of overlaid that with the fact that we're looking for a partner. And throughout the whole process, there was a kind of an undertone of me checking What's the partnership going to be like? And that ended up being one of the defining features of, of the vendor that we chose is that we weren't going to end up being just a very small fish in their pond and ignored. But actually, you know, their customer success team came in during the sales cycle to talk about exactly what would be happening later on in, in the life cycle after we deployed. That made a big difference to us. Were there some additional specific features that you were looking for because it was a customer satisfaction solution for onboarding. For example, were you looking for the survey solution to integrate and automatically send the surveys based on milestones in the onboarding journey, for example? Exactly that. We wanted to reach certain milestones of the project and have that trigger a survey to go out. That, that itself isn't completely complicated. What seems to be harder is that after the customer's taken the survey, I need that information to be automatically pulled back into Salesforce <laughs> and linked together with the project, with the account, with the customer and with the progress. So I need to be able to say, what are my survey results for each region, each project manager, for the kickoff stage, the go live stage, the closure stage, so I can kind of track that journey. It's a pretty simple user case in my mind, but you know, some of the requirements, it's you need to kind of take very, very large packages with very, very complicated API setups. We're very lucky to find a vendor that in the end had a fairly simple kind of plug and play. Again, Salesforce, no code, just a couple of clicks. Great, the whole thing's connected and that's triggered from the project. So project moves to a certain stage, Customer gets an email saying, would you take this survey? It's quite an attractive survey screen. They take it and it pulls that information through back into Salesforce. So you chose, so obviously your Salesforce shop, that was a big yeah. component in some of the decisions as well. You chose a project solution that integrated with Salesforce and you chose a service solution that integrated with Salesforce. And so the service solution doesn't necessarily have to integrate with the project management solution or the onboarding tool. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to use the same survey tool for our service cloud deployment. As cases get closed, we send out a survey. We're also about to release our first MPS survey going out to our customers. Again, we're using the same platform. You can customize the survey. We send it out to whoever we've marked as to be a receiver, anybody that fills it in. The information's brought straight back into the CRM so that we've got that holistic view of the customer, which we never had before because everything was in siloed systems. And so which survey solution did you end up choosing, if you don't mind sharing? So we're using Typeform. Oh, Typeform. Yeah, I heard a lot about it. So just to clarify, you didn't really purchase an onboarding tool. You purchased a survey tool and a project management tool. 
And by integrating them with Salesforce, you essentially knocked off all the business questions and intentions for increasing collaboration and visibility that you were seeking. Yeah, I think Procursive probably would say that they're an onboarding tool as well as a project management tool. It's two platforms. One was definitely an onboarding piece and one was a professional services automation PSA piece. And they've kind of pulled them together. The bit that for me was missing was the survey component and the ability to send and link surveys to it. So going out, we bought that as another product and kind of bolted the two together. So what were the main criteria for you to choose a solution for onboarding? And tell us a little bit more about the software that you picked for your implementation team. We picked a tool called Procursive. It's two tools. Effectively, they, they have a PSA project management tool. They have an onboarding tool, which looks a little bit like a Trello Trello Kanban board where you move activities. You can get both of them completely tied together. So the tool that we got was both of these elements. So now when a deal is closed, we can automatically create a project. It's not kind of take away how big a deal that is, right? That pipeline of creating a project, which was yeah. maybe two or three days work is now automated. The people on the front end who have got tasks to do can see very simply, I've got this task impending. I can move it from here to here to here. And project managers can get a full view of all the different tasks of all the different people that are working on their projects as well as view of the time, the revenue, the costs. And then me as a leader, I can get dashboards of all of it rolled up together, split by region, split by individual. Very, very powerful stuff. Wow. Okay. How did the deployment go? And what did you learn from that experience that you can share with others that are watching the video? What to avoid, what definitely to pay attention to? Knowing that we were going to put it on Salesforce. I knew immediately that we were going to need some integrations. So we've got Jira, which is a tool used by a lot of our development and back office teams. We've got NetSuite, which is used by our finance team. And we needed to make sure the tools were talking. So we, we have an intermiddle and interim software that connects them. And we knew that we were going to have to build integrations. But still, as we went through the deployment, we keep coming up with these challenges to say, oh, these platforms are tied together in this way. Oh, this team also uses this. And there were things that we hadn't found out. Yeah, the whole way through, we kind of kept coming up with these and having to just twist the integration that little bit more. But one of the things we tried to kind of not fall into, I guess, the trap of was doing decisions by committee, bringing together huge numbers of people to decide on things because we wanted to move quite quickly. You know, looking back on it, I think probably we could have had a stronger input from our stakeholder group to make sure that when we actually released the product, they were really bought into it. It was their system that had been deployed rather than a PMO system that had been sent out to them. Brilliant. So you had a strategy roadmap that included a technology component. You made advances and maybe optimized some of the processes. Then you chose a solution, you implemented it. You get some success in adopting it in key areas of the business. What is the impact and what were you able to achieve from this from a business standpoint? From deployment, the first couple of months is split evenly between drowning in data that we didn't have before and then using that to identify new data that we now want to go and get. So each data set we're looking at suggests something else. So I can suddenly see that there's a load of projects that are older than I would want them to be. So now I want to go in and look at them and say, okay, well, when was the last interaction? Are we still working on them or are they stagnant? And so we're kind of starting to spend all this time churning over the data saying, I really want to know more whilst trying to use that to change the way that we're working. One of the key outcomes that we've been able to see actually is around our utilization. So if I look at the four months before we delivered to the four months after, we saw a 10% improvement in utilization. That's billable time from the team. Over that four months, a 10% improvement in the time that we're billing. And yeah, I can't think any services leader out there that doesn't want to be able to say, great, over the course of four, six months, I can get 10% more billable time from a team that I've got. Because you have all these insights now, do you see an improvement in the strategy and re-optimization of the processes? Do you feel like the PMO office is more efficient now that they can make data-driven decisions? The PMO is, is absolutely far more efficient. Rather than moving data from one system to another, the data is already there. At the end of the month, we were previously spending three or four days collecting all of the data in terms of billable time, run that against the projects that we've done and come out with some sort of revenue number and say, great. And that was 
the fourth of the next month. Now that information's live and I can track that on a daily basis and say, great, based on the billable time that's been done to date, here's where we are. And we can make business decisions. And that's what we've been able to achieve is far more consistent results that we can predict throughout the month rather than having a number kind of come up three or four days into the next month that we can't influence at all. What's next for you? You've implemented the system, you're getting insights. Is there like a phase two in mind? What's your vision for 2022? As I said, one of the reasons we wanted a partnership with a vendor was we're going to iterate. I've done it before where we put a system in, you want to keep changing it and improving it and getting that little bit more from it. We're looking at communities as a way for our customers to interact. So I think it's it's called Experience Cloud. The intention there is that customers can come and they can own activities actually on the project that they can mark as complete or that they can create new tasks and say, can you do this for me? As a way to really kind of close that interaction gap down, they will be directly kind of influencing the project. We're also now reviewing fully our end-to-end delivery process. So statement of work through to closure of a project, handover to CSM, hypercare, that full piece Now that we have a tool in place, the idea is the tool removes any blockers. We're a bit less restricted. So what would we really like to do if we if we never had the restrictions of systems? Looking back, if you could give yourself advice, would you do anything differently? What would you tell yourself in terms of tips on how to approach selecting an onboarding tool? It's incredibly important to understand where you are today, where you want to get to and have plans to move forward. And don't put it all about being on the tool, right? Don't say the tool is going to fix all the problems. Know what those problems are, define what the solution is and and know how the tool is going to help you to do that. Because we've all seen customers who will put a tool in place on top of poor processes and it just doesn't work. Then make sure that the tool is specifically there going to help fix those issues. So if you've got one that you know you want to fix, check, how is it going to do it? exactly what features it is it's going to use. And then the last piece is to make sure that you're considering that relationship that you want to have both internally and with the vendor. Guys, if you're looking for an onboarding tool, I'm going to share in the link below one, the LinkedIn post that's got me to connect with Phil Devitt here around onboarding tools, where I posted a poll to say, which one are you using? And a lot of people commented with great advice and like recommendations for different solutions. And so you could check that out. And I'm also going to include a downloadable for onboarding tool tech stack. So you could just pick and choose whatever makes sense for you and start your way in selecting the right vendor that would be your next partner in making your strategy optimized and scalable for your implementation pleasures. Thank you so much, Phil. Guys, I'll see you at the next video. 